live on now. Good evening, one and all person here, and uh, all the uh, good evening, all the viewers. So, and a very good morning for uh, Dr. Uh, Hugo Oliver Vargas. So, he joined with us with a new topic, and it is slightly have a, some uh, relation between yesterday's topic. It is uh, uh, today, Hugo Oliver Vargas, he is from the University of uh, National University of Mexico. He is as working as an assistant professor there. He will talk about uh, bioelectrophenone process and its application in wastewater treatment. And we have uh, three panel members: Dr. Sarabjan Sevda from IIT Guwahati, and Dr. Rajesh Singh from uh, Central University Gandhagar, and Dr. Bhubadi Ramaswamy from CSRI IMMT Bhubaneswar. So before starting the program, I just introduce Hugo, Dr. Hugo, to, to you people. Dr. Hugo Oliver Vargas holds a master's degree in analytical chemistry from Autonomous University of the State of Mexico and doctorate in chemistry and environmental science through the prestigious Erasmus Munde program. Besides, he process Process research experience from National University of Singapore in US, University of Toulouse and Paul Sabetier, France, University of Paris, East, National Museum of National, Natural History, France. An innovative uh, educator, currently he is an assistant professor of National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, Institute of Renewable Energies. He is a recipient of prestigious engineering achievement award by the Institute of Engineers, Singapore. Best PhD thesis in science and engineering in University of Paris in 2015, and a distinguished member of the Mexican national research system. To his credit, he has several peer reviewed articles in international journals, three books, chapters, and three patented patent submissions. So Hugo, please start your presentation. Yes, hello everybody. Thank you, Prof. Nitish, for the for the introduction. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to be with you this uh, today, this uh, evening in India and early morning in Mexico. I'm very happy to be here, and I will be talking about bioelectrophenone and some of the fundamentals of application of this. Uh, emerging technology. As Prof. Nidish uh, said, I'm from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, uh, the Institute for Renewable Energies, where I'm currently assistant professor. Well, I think that I will start now directly with the presentation. I want to start talking about emerging contaminants and water pollution. This is something that you may be familiar with because I think that you've been talking about wastewater treatment during this uh, webinar series. And well, we know that uh, emerging contaminants are chemicals. Sorry, emerging contaminants are chemicals or not chemicals that are likely to enter the environment by different paths. They of course, they of course pose a serious health or environmental risk, uh, these kind of substances are not under regulation or regulation is under development. Uh, some of them are highly refractory to conventional wastewater treatment and this is why they are important. And uh, I think that you have heard a lot of things about emerging contaminants. I think that, uh, for example, pharmaceuticals in India is a very relevant, uh, relevant topic. 
But there are many different types of compounds, industrial chemicals, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, as I mentioned, personal care products, nanomaterials, metals, and also biological compounds. Well, this, uh, when we talk about biological compounds, we live in a very difficult time and we can't uh, avoid thinking about the, the, the coronavirus. Well, viruses are also some sort of emerging contaminants. Uh, these, these contaminants came to the environment. Well, one of the most important things that uh, were developed for the, for the detection of the emerging contaminants is a very wide range of analytical techniques that allowed us to identify them, to quantify them in the environment, and to see their consequences. So after this uh, revolution in analytical techniques, we find we found a lot of emerging contaminants. Uh, some toxicity tests were conducted, and people showed that they were indeed very toxic, and they were posing a serious problem. This is why during late in the I think late in the 1980s, advanced oxidation processes emerged as an important alternative to treat wastewater with this kind of refractory compounds, which couldn't be treated by conventional means. And advanced oxidation processes are chemical-based uh, techniques. They are fundamented on the generation of hydroxyl radicals, which are very strong oxidant species with a very high standard reduction potential of 2.8 volts versus the standard hydrogen electrode. And well, there are different types of uh, advanced oxidation processes that have been used to treat this kind of compounds in wastewater, of course, mainly in wastewater, but they also they have also been used in disinfection and uh, mainly in disinfection in wastewater. Well, among these advanced oxidation processes, there are the, the electrochemical techniques, which we call the electrochemical advanced oxidation processes, EUPs. And what is uh, particular about these kind of processes is that during electrochemical advanced oxidation processes, the oxidants or hydroxyl radicals mainly are produced in situ during the reaction. And we use only the electron as electricity to generate them. So we don't have to, to handle hazardous chemicals virtually. And also virtually there is no generation of secondary sludge that requires further treatment or disposal. EAOPs have shown very high mineralization efficiencies. They operate at my conditions and they are easy to, to automate, which are very important advantages that have made electrochemical techniques to stand up among the advanced oxidation processes. Some of the most common electrochemical advanced oxidation processes are anodic oxidation, electrophenton, photoelectrocatalysis, and some combination of these processes. This kind of uh, processes or the classification depends on the electrochemical properties of the materials that are used as electrodes. So the materials dictate the kind of process meaning the kind of uh, oxidizing species that are produced and how and in which conditions. I think that you will be talking about these kind of processes specifically during this web uh, webinar series. And today I will be focusing on the electrophenton process and specifically the biological part. Before I go into the electrophenton process and bioelectrophenton, which is the topic of, this, of the webinar, I want to talk a little bit about the reactivity of hydroxyl radicals. I think this part will be covered uh, later, uh, but I, will, I, want to talk on the, I want to talk about the basis of this. Uh, there are three main modes of action of hydroxyl radicals for the oxidation of organic contaminants. The first one is the dehydrogenation, uh, producing carbon radicals. Then we have the hydroxylation of uh, electron density rich compounds, like for example, double bonds, uh, double bonds or aromatic compounds. Uh, this produces hydroxylated uh, compounds, carbon radicals, 
And as you can see in the slide, the, the kinetic constants are very high for these kind of reactions. There is another type of action that was proposed recently, the uh, IPSO substitution. And this is a uh, particular of halogenated compounds like chloride, uh, chlorine, bromine. And you can see the reaction here, it's only a substitution. The, the organic compound gets hydroxylated while the uh, halogen is released. This is important because we are going to talk about the reactivity uh, of hydroxyl radicals later during the electrophenton process. Now I want to talk about the main characteristics of electrophenton. Electrophenton is based on the cathodic production of hydrogen peroxide. This uh, through the two electron reduction reaction of oxygen that is dissolved in the solution. Electrophenton is a special process, one of the most widely used electrochemical advanced oxidation process because it uses affordable carbon materials for the production of hydrogen peroxide. Besides, uh, it only uses small amounts of iron ions to activate hydrogen peroxide through the Fenton's reaction, because ion two is constantly regenerated at the cathode from the reduction of ion three, as you can see in the as you can see in the in the slide. Then, of course, we have the Fenton's reaction, hydrogen peroxide and ion giving hydroxyl radicals. This is why we call this process the electrophenton process, because at the end it relies on the production of hydroxyl radicals from the Fenton's reaction. There is another important part. When the electrophenton process is conducted in an undivided cell or an undivided electrochemical reactor, uh, the, the efficiency can be enhanced when we use powerful electrodes for anodic oxidation. What you can see here in the slide is the, the use of electrophenton with a boron dot diamond electrode. Boron dot diamond is known to produce hydroxide radicals at high uh, over potentials. And by doing so, we have more hydroxide radicals that are produced and the efficiency of the process of the, of the overall process can be enhanced. One important part of electrophenton, as I told you, uh, it depends pretty much on the reactivity of the hydroxyl radicals besides the operating conditions. And, and yes, in general, degradation kinetics are faster during the first stages of treatment because of the reactivity of hydroxyl radicals with aromatic compounds or with cyclic compounds that is much uh, faster. And generally, the final byproducts before uh, formation of carbon dioxide uh, is typically slow because there are short chain carboxylic acids that are formed. These compounds uh, have a slow kinetic reaction with hydrogen radicals. You can see here in the slide, the reactions are in the order of 10 to the power of six to 10 to the power of seven, molar to the power of minus one, seconds to the power of minus one, which is relatively slower. This is why these kind of compounds, short chain carboxylic acids tend to accumulate in the solution, taking a lot of time to be degraded. And of course, when we talk about time, we talk about electricity that we are using during the process, it, these kind of compounds are responsible for the loss of efficiency and increase of energy consumption with time during, in general, electrochemical advanced oxidation processes, and in particular, the electrophenton process. Here you can see a, a reaction mechanism, uh, a scheme of the reaction mechanism which represents the mineralization pathway of real pharmaceutical wastewater. You can see at the beginning, there are a lot of aromatic compounds, bigger compounds, sub polymeric substances. When we use electrophenton, they, uh, they are cleavaged into smaller compounds, still aromatic compounds with high kinetic constants with hydroxide radicals. And then we go to the production of short chain organic acids. And at this point, the kinetics become slow because of the reactivity of these compounds. They take more time to be degraded before they are transformed into carbon dioxide. In this slide, I'm showing you the same effect with some numbers 
Here you can see, well, in these figures, I'm showing you the degradation of the industrial chemical tetramethyltacinodiol. You can see on your, on your left, the TOC evolution of this compound. You can see that it is fast at the beginning and then it becomes slower. And on your right, you can see how with time, mineralization current efficiency drops while the energy consumption increases. This is because the smaller compounds that get accumulated in the solution with time. However, uh, these organic compounds, the short chain carboxylic acid, such as oxalic acid, oxamic acid, acetic acid, glycolic, formic, malonic, glyoxylic, maleic, tartronic acid. Uh, they accumulate, as you can see here in the graph A, you can see the accumulation of this kind of organic acids uh, during the treatment of pharmaceutical wastewater. And in the figure B, you can see the accumulation during the treatment of electronics wastewater. You can clearly see how they start accumulated with time, then they reach high concentrations, and then their degradation is rather slow. And this is important because these small compounds, less reactive with hydroxyl radicals, are indeed more biodegradable. And this is how uh, we start, this is how we do the connection with bioelectrophenicol. Why to consume a lot of energy? and time to degrade small compounds that can be degraded by microorganisms. And this is how the bioelectrophenton idea emerged. The point is to use electrophenton during short treatment times just to transform those refractory compounds into biodegradable compounds. And then those biodegradable compounds can be oxidized or can be metabolized by different microorganisms during conventional biological wastewater treatment. And you can see that effect here in this graph. Electrophenton was applied to treat the, the pharmaceutical meta, metoprolol. Biodegradability of the solution was increased only in one hour when the BOD COD ratio uh, reached or was higher the threshold of 0.4 for biodegradability. And then the solution was taken to aerobic treatment in order to complete the, the treatment process. What is the main advantage of this? When you, you, you can use electrophenton for short treatment times, meaning that you can save a lot of energy, which represents, of course, a lower cost. And then you can use uh, aerobic treatment to complete the degradation of the of the organic compounds of the wastewater, and it uh, and it is very convenient because uh, biological processes are more are, are less costly, of course, than advanced oxidation processes, uh, are cheaper than EAOPs in general and uh, electrophenton in particular, because we know that a biological treatment or biological technologies are the state of the art processes for wastewater treatment. They are very well established and we know how they use and they, they are everywhere in all the wastewater treatment plants all around the world. Here you can see again the mechanism of this uh, sequential or integrated process because it takes part in two steps, electrophenton followed by biological degradation here you can see that metoprolol was transformed into smaller compounds during the treatment, uh, during the electrophenton treatment. And then these uh, small intermediates, most of them short chain carboxylic acids, were metabolized by a, by a consortium of uh, microorganisms. This strategy can be applied in two different directions. Uh, if the effluent is recalcitrant or refractory, we can apply electrophenton in order to increase the biodegradability, in order to decrease the toxicity, to produce more biodegradable compounds, and then apply the biological treatment, just as I mentioned. However, it can also go in a different direction. If the effluent is originally biodegradable, biological treatment can be applied first, then if there is formation of some recalcitrant byproducts or there are uh, recalcitrant byproducts that cannot be treated by biological means, 
then we can use the electrophantom process. So both strategies have been applied uh, in the treatment of uh, different compounds, different emerging pollutants, different toxic pollutants, and even uh, different types of real wastewater. The second, the second variant of the bioelectrophantom process is a single process. Uh, remember that for the past bioelectrophantom, there were two different stages electrophantom followed by biological treatment. Well, there is another type of bioelectrophantom that has been developed in which uh, the treatment takes in, a, in only one step. However, there are significant differences. I'm going to start talking about the main characteristics of this bioelectrophantom process, which has also been called microbial bioelectrophantom. And for this, we use, of course, a divided electrochemical cell. Uh, I want to remind you that in, in the conventional electrophantom process is typically conducted in undivided cells, where the anode and the cathode are together in the same compartment. Well, for bioelectrophantom as a single process, the, the, the electrochemical cell needs to be divided because there are two different processes taking place in the two different compartments. This is a galvanic cell, meaning that this cell produces its own electricity. Uh, the anodic and cathodic compartment are separated by an ion exchange membrane, and electricity is produced from the microbial oxidation at the anode, as we will be, uh, as we will be discussing, and hydrogen peroxide is produced as the cathode, triggering the electrophantom degradation of organic pollutants in the way that we have explained. Here you can see the graphs. You can see the anodic compartment, which contains a biofilm that oxidizes organic matter, producing electrons, then go to the external circuit. They go directly to the cathode, and the cathode promotes the electrophantom process meaning the reduction of oxygen into hydrogen peroxide to promote the uh, Fenton's reaction. These two compartments are separated, as I mentioned, by an ion exchange membrane that allows the circulation of ions in order to allow for neutrality. We will be discussing each one of the, each one of the components in the following slides. Let's start uh, talking about the anodic reactions, uh, of course, there has to be electroactive bacteria that oxidize organic matter and release electrons during this process. These electrons, of course, are going to generate the electricity that is necessary for the electrophantom process to take place for the reduction of oxidation, oxi uh, reduction of oxygen, sorry, to take place. Uh, what is particular about these bacteria? Well, they can do electron transfer either directly or exocellular electron transfer, which occurs via C-type cytochromes on the, on the outer membrane of the microorganisms. And the electron transfer can be also mediated by primary or secondary metabolites produced by the microorganisms. Uh, the most common or the most well-studied uh, strains for this kind of processes are the Geobacter and Shunella. However, well, generally, and it, it is more convenient to use a, an enriched consortia, which is more stable and more robust for the operation of this kind of process. I think that when we talk about bioelectrophantom, we talk of uh, we talk about uh, microbial fuel cells. Those are the fundamentals of bioelectrophantom. The difference is that in the cathodic compartment, we have electron materials that promote the electrophantom reactions. And I think that we have discussed microbial fuel cells in the previous sessions of this seminar. What I'm showing you here in this uh, in the slide is the general oxidation of organic compounds by the microorganisms producing carbon dioxide, protons, and electrons. Protons will go to the, will be exchanged, will flow through the membrane to the other compartment, while electrons will be flowing 
uh, into the external circuit to, for the production of electricity. And this is how we can do the treatment also in this anodic compartment. The substrate of the organic matter can be either wastewater or another type of organic substrate that can be assimilated by the microorganisms, such as glucose or uh, this type of common substrates. This is, uh, yes, I forgot to mention that this is an anaerobic process that takes place in this part of the, this part of the electrochemical, bioelectrochemical reactor. The main characteristics of the anode materials for these kinds of applications, they have to be, of course, biocompatible because there is a biofilm that will be formed on its surface. It has to be non-toxic, highly conductive, stable, and of course, it has to, hire, to have a high surface area so we can capture a lot of electrons and produce a good amount of electricity for the electrophenton process. The most common use materials for these applications have been, of course, carbon materials. They, are, they have all these characteristics that I just mentioned. And the most utilized have been carbon felt, carbon fibers, graphite, granular graphite, and also ion, which is not a, which is not carbon, of course, but it's the non-carbon material that has been the that has been used with more more uh, frequency. Now let's move to the cathodic reactions. Let's move to the cathodic compartment. I don't want to go into details because this is what we have discussed uh, since the beginning. In the cathodic compartment, we have the, the reduction of oxygen via three electrons forming hydrogen peroxide. Then we have the Fenton's reaction triggered by uh, ion ions in the solution. It gives the hydroxyl radicals, which can oxidize the organic matter. We also have, as I mentioned in the beginning, the reduction of ion three, regenerating constantly ion two ions in the solution. And then we have the, the oxidation of organic matter through a very complex series of reactions. Here you can see the, the production of uh, organic radicals, then or, or, uh, organic radicals react with oxygen in the solution, hydroxide radicals forming uh, peroxide and oxide radicals that will finally lead to the production of carbon dioxide. And these peroxide and oxide radicals will form those double, those uh, carbonyl groups in the short chain carboxylic acids that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, another important part here is that the Fenton's reaction takes place at pH three. So the pH of the cathodic compartment needs to be controlled uh, in order to favor the Fenton's reaction. In the case of the anodic compartment, uh, the pH needs to be uh, near neutral because of the microorganisms. But I think that we will discuss it a little bit later. What about the cathode materials for electrophenton? As I mentioned in the beginning, carbon materials have been the most used uh, electrodes for electrophenton. Again, they have very important uh, characteristics. They are non toxic, they are abundant, uh, they are not expensive, which is important. And most importantly, carbon materials have shown good electrocatalytic properties for the production of hydrogen peroxide through the reduction of oxygen, which is the core of the electrophenton system. Uh, let's talk about the ion catalyst. Uh, in order to catalyze the electrophenton reaction, the Fenton reaction, that is the correct term, in order to catalyze the Fenton reaction, uh, we can use either homogeneous catalyst or heterogeneous catalyst. Uh, when we use homogeneous catalysts like ion sulfate, which has been the most used catalyst for homogeneous electrophenton reactions, uh, the pH is very, very important. The pH needs to be acid a close to a value of three. And this is mainly because of the speciation of ion species in solution, ion three. At pH three, ion, uh, ion two is available for the Fenton's reaction. Ion three is, still, is available to get reduced. And there is no uh, precipitation. Precipitation of ion three ions takes place at a 
higher pH. And uh, when ion precipitates, of course, it is not available in the solution for the Fenton's reaction. However, electrophenton can also be conducted uh, using heterogeneous catalysts, such as uh, nanoparticles, ion nanoparticles, ion oxide nanoparticles, some uh, minerals, natural minerals like pyrite, pyrite or calcopyrite. And we can also use uh, carbon materials that are impregnated with ion or ion oxides as a source of, uh, of catalyst for the Fenton reaction, as you can see in this figure. The main advantage of heterogeneous electrophenton is that it, it allows uh, to perform the electrophenton process in a broader pH range. And this is because uh, there are surface fenton-like reactions that help the process, that allows the, pro the process to take place, the Fenton's reaction to take place. And I think that this is one of the main advantages of heterogeneous electrophenton. Uh, electrons can be modified, ions can be incorporated or introduced to the cathode to promote fenton, uh, the fenton reaction. Of course, when we have ion species uh, on a surface, there can be also the leakage of ion ions in the solution, which will promote homogeneous fenton's reactions. Uh, the electrolyte is also very important when conducting electrochemical technologies because, as I mentioned, we have, uh, well, in electrochemistry, we have to have a conductive medium that allows electricity to flow. This is why it is very common to add electrolyte to, to the solution or to the wastewater. And if it is not conducted enough for the reactions, electrochemical reactions to take place. And in this particular case, in this kind of electrophenton process in WASTEP, uh, there are different characteristics of the analyte and the catholyte. The analyte needs to be rich in nutrients for the microorganisms. It has to possess a source of carbon also for the microorganisms, and the pH has to be neutral between six and eight, as I mentioned before. Uh, the source of carbon, as I told you, can be something that we can control, something that can be easily assimilated by the microorganisms, such as glucose, acetate, or it can be the wastewater itself. If, if the organic compounds present in the wastewater can be metabolized by the microorganisms. In the case of the catalyte, uh, sulfate has been the most used electrolyte because of its properties. However, uh, chloride ions can be used. Uh, wastewater rich in chloride ions can be directly used, no need to add additional electrolyte. And the optimal pH should be three for a homogeneous electrophenton. And it can be extended in the case of heterogeneous electrophenton, as I mentioned. The membranes, remember that the cathodic and anodic compartments are splitted. And the membrane is very important because it will allow the ions to move in order to reach uh, the neutrality of the system. Uh, some membranes have been used, like uh, most commonly cata uh, cationic ex exchange membranes, proton exchange membranes. Uh, they have good mechanical strength, high proton transfer rate, high stability. Uh, some of them can be expensive, however, uh, some of them allow oxygen and substrate crossover and the transport of other cations, which is undesirable because other cations or oxygen or the substrate can interfere in the efficiency of either the anodic processes or the cathodic processes. There are cation exchange membranes and proton exchange membranes have been the most utilized membranes for these kinds of applications. However, there are also anion exchange membranes, which have good stability, uh, there is good flow. However, there is biofouling, they are very susceptible to deformation, and uh, they tend to degrade in alkaline environment. Uh, there are other options, some, such as ceramic membranes. Ceramic membranes, even though they, are, they have low cost, they are a little bit brittle, 
that is uh, their nature. And there are composite membranes and graphene membranes. However, this kind of membranes uh, can be a bit costly and they, they require a lot of steps for their fabrication. Another important part is the reactor design. As I told you before, the two chambers, anode and cathode, need to be separated. So the most common configuration are shown in this picture. Down here, you can see the most common one has been the H-type bottles, H-type reaction, a uh, reactor, sorry, with two bottles here that are separated by the membrane. Uh, another common configuration has been the rectangular one. The two compartments are re rectangular and they are connected by the membrane, just like in the case of microbial, uh, microbial fuel cells. And there are other more uh, innovative configurations like these cylinders that of course are separated by a membrane. And in this reactor configuration here, it's a special configuration because there is a conventional electrophenton reactor here with uh, two electrodes in the same compartment. However, they are, they, the reaction is fooled by the electricity produced by a microbial fuel cells. It has been a different configuration, a, a little bit different than the common bioelectrophenton process that, that has been used. How do we evaluate the performance of the process? Well, first of all, as we are producing electricity, we have to evaluate the electricity of the power that we produce. Power equals uh, potential times current. If we take into consideration the uh, Ohm's law, power equals the potential squared divided by the resistance of the system. It can be normalized to the area of the electrode or to the volume of the, of the reactor. Two other important parameters are the, col the Coulombic efficiency. Uh, it measures the capacity to produce electricity in the anodic compartment, the, the, the amount of charge that passes the area of the electrode that is transformed into electricity. Here you can see the equation that includes the, the molecular weight of the substrate that is used, the, the current, the time, the volatile constant, the, the volume, and the decay of concentration. We also have, well, it can be calculated by a simple substrate in the case of glucose, for example, or complex substrates like in the case of wastewater. And there is another important parameter, the parodic efficiency, which is related with the efficiency to produce hydrogen peroxide. And as you can see in the equation, uh, it is related to the concentration of hydrogen peroxide that is produced, meaning how efficiently the electrodes that are produced during the anodic oxy uh, the biological oxidation are used to produce hydrogen peroxide in the cathodic chamber. Here in this, uh, in this table, I'm just showing some applications of this process. It has been used to treat different kinds of organic pollutants like organic dyes, pharmaceuticals, uh, different industrial chemicals, but it has also been applied to treat some types of wastewater. For example, in the first row, you can see the treatment of uh, medicinal herbs wastewater. It was conducted in a rectangular reactor the, the adult was carbon felt, the cathode was carbon felt and modified with uh, iron oxide as a source of catalyst. The membrane was a napion, napion membrane that separated the two compartments. Uh, the conditions only 100 milliliters of uh, electrolyte. The pH in the cathode was three. And then uh, there was enough sulfate in the wastewater as electrolyte. You can see that removal efficiency at the adult was very low, only 8% of COD removal. Uh, the removal at the cathode was, was good, 84% of COD removal. However, it was achieved in a very long time of 50 hours. The energy production was uh, almost 50 milliwatts per square meter.
Another example that you can see in the table is the treatment of landfill leachate. Uh, H-type boros was the reactor type, the anode was carbon felt, the cathode was also carbon felt, a cation exchange membrane was used to separate the two chambers. Then uh, the electrolyte was the wastewater itself with a high content of chloride ions. The pH uh, was adjusted to a pH 3 in the cathode. An ion sulfate was used as a homogeneous catalyst. The removal efficiency was 49% of COD removal in the, in the anode chamber and only 40% in the cathode and it took several days. Uh, the energy production was 1.7 amperes per square meter. And I think these examples are representative of the conditions that are used for bioelectrophenton in one step, of the, the results that are obtained. In general, the degradation efficiencies are low, especially in the anodic compartment and uh, it generate, it takes a lot of time uh, for the treatment. And it takes me to the main challenges of this kind of technology. Uh, some of them are the high price of the membrane. And we have, in general, low mineralization efficiencies, large treatment times, uh, a low production of current, uh, because of the because of the biological oxidation, it is a difficult process, and indeed the electron transfer by the biofilm to the anode surface is the rate limiting step in this kind of processes. Uh, there are several pH adjustment steps in the cathode chamber, and the tendency is that very high concentration of ion sludge is formed because in a biological electrophenton, the concentrations of ion catalysts have been generally high or higher than in conventional electrophenton. Uh, the future research in this technology includes the, the development of nanomaterial structure cathodes for electrophenton and also for biological electrotransfer uh, people are working, researchers are working in the, develop, uh, in the development of new electrons also for, that can be compatible with the biofilm, they can allow or can uh, enhance the electron transfer. So these are active fields of research uh, for the biological oxidation and also for the electrophenton process to enhance the electrocatalytic properties of the electron to produce hydrogen peroxide. Uh, there is also uh, research opportunities in composite electrodes containing iron-based catalysts. Uh, there is the need to do more work on green wastewater because most of the investigations are conducted in using synthetic solution of target compounds uh, for the sake of simplicity. And of course, another important point is the reactor design for large-scale applications. This is very important because, well, the efficiency of the process and how scalable it can be depends on a very good reactor design. And remember that in this part, we are dealing with a non-divided cell that requires to separate the anodic and, com and, and cathodic compartments. So we need to put a, uh, a membrane between them. And in general, when we talk about uh, divided reactors, the separation between the anode and the cathode is higher and it entails higher resistance, which is uh, bad for energy consumption. So the electric, the reactor design will be something that, uh, that needs to be improved, just like in the case of microbial fluid cells. And I think that I have reached the end of this, uh, this talk. If you have questions, I think that we can move to the questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hugo, for this uh, good talk. Uh, it is uh, already covered the basics of uh, uh, bioelectrophenone, all the combinations, all these things. Uh, apart from a researcher, this talk already revealed that you are a good teacher also. 
so next we can go for a <laughs> yeah next we can go for a, um, a panel discussion dr rajesh singh if you have any questions please raise your questions yeah thanks for uh, i think that that is uh, this presentation is very well balanced and focused on the area and basically uh, while uh, seeing this presentation i saw that this uh, phase i think where you when in first phase you are using this uh, phantom and in next phase you are using this uh, biological treatment i think it is an interesting area i also observed that uh, while we are applying this you can say that like in pre cleaner in sewage waste water treatment and we are getting a good efficiency in uh, removal of you can say that most of the pollutant and further we are feeding this uh, water to the constructed wetland normally we know that uh, this uh, constructed wetland we can feed at uh, lower pollutant loading rate so it is a fantastic idea but uh, i am thinking here about because uh, we are applying here high voltage in this system like what is the state of this microbial system here whether this microbe will be able to survive or what will be the impact on this uh, biota basically in this phantom system sorry sorry can you repeat the question yeah. because i actually my question is like that because, because we are applying a okay. high voltage i think this is the 2.8 volt yes yeah uh, what is the you can say that possibility that micro will be affected by this uh, high voltage Yes, Either of the, course. I yeah. think that the, yes, yes, yes. I think that the microbial well, or the the microbial communities can be very sensitive to different yeah, things. Yes. I think yes. just like any type of wastewater treatment, they can be very, very sensitive, and we have to put a lot of attention in the different kinds of wastewater that we can use for biological degradation. And this is why in some of the bioelectrophenton systems, uh, sometimes when the wastewater is not treatable. People prefer to use another organic substrate, which can be easily assimilated by the microorganisms, or they can use both a mix of wastewater with some organic substrate to facilitate the growth of the microorganisms. But definitely, some types of wastewater cannot be used uh, in the biological chamber. And this is why it has to be treated in the electrophenton chamber or using a advanced treatment yeah, that can, that can be. both both the chamber will be the separate sorry uh, first this phantom uh, the reaction chamber will be i think first phase and second phase will be this biological is it, it will be like an integrated type they can be recirculated some people have recirculated the wastewater from one chamber to the other but of course it has to be the the conditions need to be taken into account because of the ph mainly so for example if you are doing biological treatment if at some point no more degradation is observed then mm. the the waste water from the from the anodic chamber can be sent to the cathodic chamber however ph adjustment steps need uh, to be considered because of the efficiency of, of the processes. And the same, sometimes when we have very contaminated water in the electrophenton chamber, when you increase the biodegradability, you can send that effluent to the anodic chamber, but taking care of the pH of the solution so you don't pollute or you don't kill the microorganisms. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Suraj, yes, if you yes. have any questions. If you have yeah. any questions, please raise your question. Yeah. Uh, this is a very good talk, and as you in, uh, informed earlier, that he's a good teacher. So Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, it's very good. And also, actually, I'm also in the same area, and you have a lot of equations you given. So for the young researchers, they can easily go over mass balance for protons, electrons, and it will also help them to design properly. And so uh, my yes, question is only some basic, only basic idea, like in the in the beginning. Uh, and anode and cathode don't have any membrane. We are in the, in the initial, initial slides. And then you go with the, um, like the microbial fuel cell mode, we have membrane. So uh, what you see in the production of S2O2 without membrane and with the membrane? Uh, I mean, how much the efficiency and the total time of the reaction? 
how how it goes like in the initial reactors we don't have any membrane only anode and cathode, anode and cathode was there and later on you move to the mfc mode and there we have separated and also you also given very nice uh, classifications with the different membranes with their pros and cons either is this a ceramic mem membranes either is the ion exchange membrane and all the other, other things so what do you think that uh, what are the key challenges like is the only electrodes only membranes only electron designs type of substrates like what is your overall like if somebody want to uh, go ahead so where he focus mainly i think that for me the most important part of this point is reactor design for scaling up mm -hmm. because uh, yes when you talk about the development of electrodes yes they can be the efficiencies can be enhanced etc however mm -hmm. It is known that electrodes, so there are materials that work, let's say, properly. Yeah. So you can get you can get reasonable results, even though not the best results, but reasonable results with the existing material. So I definitely think that the main challenge should be the reactor design at this point. I think that people should be focusing on reactor design to, to try to scale up the technology, because we know this technology is fundamented on microbial fuel cell. We all yes. know what, which are the problems of microbial fuel cells. It's exactly the same here. So mm -hmm. I think that it has to be, a lot of work needs to be done on reactor design. And of course, to test these kind of processes with real wastewater. This is what we have been discussing with uh, Professor Rajesh about mm -hmm. the types of wastewater. Uh, mm -hmm. When we use real wastewater, we have to put attention to the, to the constituents of the water because they can, poly they can, kill the microorganisms they can be they can also be they can also affect the performance of the electrophenton process for example if the wastewater contain radical scavengers yeah so i think that the work with real conditions is ideal for the development of this technology i don't know if you agree with me no, no, yes, yes. And also, only one small, uh, like i want to know uh, what is the uh, the c columnic efficiency in your system the like, economic uh, efficiency of what? Yeah, in the system, what is the range that you are getting in this one, uh, this uh, Fenton process? The columnic efficiency, ferratic efficiency. Like, what is the range you are getting? Yes, let me let me check if I have these uh, numbers right here. No, I don't have the columbic efficiency ranges. Here. Okay, no problem. I will no have problem. To check it, and I will give it. I can give it to you later. Yeah, no problem. No, no, it's, 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 Yes, because it is generally measured in terms of the electricity production. Yeah, because here basically the pH in the cathodic is around three, yes. right? So that's yes, why, yes. Uh, yeah, that's uh, due to that maybe we will get to see very nicely here. Very good see will be getting. That is a good uh, advantage we have with the system. Okay. So, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. And I will write you uh, for, for further like uh, interaction. I will write you on my on your email ID. No problem. For the Faradic efficiency for the production of hydrogen peroxide, it should be in the range of 30 to 60 percent. Those yeah, yeah. are like typical values in electrophenton that apply yeah. also here in biological electrophenton. Yeah, thank you from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bobadi, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh... Thank you, uh, Dr. Hugo. It was a nice presentation and uh, it's like uh, enlightening to the research scholars, I mean, who really want to pursue their, you know, I mean, program in this uh, electrophenton or bio uh, process. Uh, and uh, I have some couple of questions uh, regarding this. You have mentioned that electrophenton uh, processes, uh, as you mentioned that uh, sulfate, I mean, uh, uh, ions is required, electrolytes. Uh, uh, actually, if you have a uh, chloride, uh, maybe in the system or in the wastewater, uh, maybe you said that you didn't work out with the wastewater, but still you mentioned uh, that the chloride ions are there, I mean, as a electrolyte. Uh, do you think, is it really favoring uh, with the uh, conductivity? Uh, because I found that uh, there are some processes which may also be able to generate the trihalomethane, which is like considered to be a carcinogenic in a, a Pollutant. It's like a byproduct which is generated when we have uh, like a long time of uh, electrolysis process or high voltage. Yes. So, what is your uh, opinion in that one? Yes, of course, that is very important. And this is why sulfate has been the preferred electrolyte in electrochemical technologies because of that. 
because chloride can promote the formation of chlorinated compounds that can be very toxic. However, when you have already wastewater containing chloride ions, well, it's very difficult to avoid it. So you have, what you can do is to enhance the mineralization efficiency in order to destroy also those uh, chlorinated compounds. And that is one of the good uh, points of the advantages of electrophenton is that mineralization efficiencies are generally high, which means that you can also degrade all, all those uh, chlorinated compounds that can be toxic, but of course. Uh, that is one limitation when we use chlorinated compounds and mineralization efficiencies are not high enough, the formation of toxic products. Uh, at the point, I think what I can take it from you is that uh, we should stop the process in a quick time, I mean, the uh, quick uh, rate of flexion. Then we should go for, uh, I mean, only mineralization we have to perform in this process. Then it has to be taken to uh, biological or uh, some other uh, process so that we can avoid this uh, secondary pollutant formation. Am I correct? Uh, Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. As I mentioned, you can also, in this kind of systems, integrated systems, you can play in that sense. You can stop the reaction in the most convenient time, and then you can apply a different strategy in order to deal with the pollutants that you have. Yes. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, is there any, uh, I mean, kind of a, a post treatment which you performed? I mean, uh, for example, if after treatment, if there is a heavy metals or in presence of heavy metals uh, or uh, what I can say, some other uh, influencing factors, did you perform any study in your uh, system? Apart from this uh, COD as a terminology which you're saying, uh, what yes, I can that... say like a, a carbonate or alkalinity as a, that's, as a one of the factors which may influence your performance. Have you performed any study in that uh, regards? Uh... Yes, that is, a, that is a very interesting question because I want to, uh, I have to make clear that electrochemical technologies in general, in particular, uh, particularly the electrophenton process, we deal with organic pollutants. Yes. The point is to destroy organic pollutants. What happens, uh, of course, the inorganic species that are in the wastewater or in the solution, yes. they will also be affected by the process, by the hydroxide radicals, by the electrochemical reactions, they can suffer oxidation or reduction at the anode or cathode uh, uh, places. However, the, ra the radicals will, will be no... The point of the electrophenton process is not to deal with these kinds of organics. Once the mineralization is done, once the treatment of organics is done, we have to think of a different process to deal with the inorganic species. And it can be, for example, chloride can also form uh, perchlorate or chlorate that need to be treated if they are present in important concentrations. And for that, we have to use different types of technologies. Okay. For example, we can use, talking about electrochemical processes, we can use um, capacitive deionization to treat okay. uh, inorganic ions, for example, or we can use only uh, membrane processes, ion exchange, to get rid of some of these uh, ions. But this is something that has to be implemented during the process, the treatment of inorganic species. Okay, I mean, uh, you are saying that the process should be like integrated one to target each exactly. uh, pollutant individually. So that's how exactly. overall performance can be achieved. Exactly. And, and you, uh, as you said, as you said, the performance of the electrophenton process for organic treatment can be influenced by these inorganic species. Yes. Of course, there, as I mentioned, there can be scavengers like chloride ions themselves yeah. in high concentrations. They can, they can be detrimental for the electrophenton process. Mm -hmm. uh, carbonate, bicarbonate can also be detrimental. So this is why I insist that we have to make more studies on real wastewaters in order to assess the real uh, influence of all these species in the overall performance of the of the process. Uh, my last question uh, from your study. Uh, I mean, which kind of yellow tone material will, will you recommend now? For uh, for example, which for anode, type of what? Yellow tone material you will recommend yes. uh, from your study. Anode. I mean, what is the I mean uh, recommended material which you recommend for a process? Like I, uh, I think I think the more suitable materials, the most suitable materials for these kinds of applications are carbon felt and carbon fibers, definitely. Okay. Okay. 
thank you thank you for the discussion so thank you all the panelists and uh, dr hugo for this wonderful discussions so uh, today we discussed about uh, uh, bioaltrofendon and it's uh, some modifications because in uh, 2000 in the beginning of 2000 altrofendon started then it's modified a lot a lot of uh, additions heterogeneous altrofendon it came into the picture for the, as a modification then in 2014 or 2013 14 uh, again uh, professor fortiran and groups they started bioaltrofendon because we know that after a some time it is quite difficult to oxidize all the carboxylic acids it will be formed during the altrofendon process after 2014 again the same group or uh, including hugo and uh, so many people they worked on uh, bioaltrofendon they used mfc as a source for uh, bioaltrofendon some of the groups they used uh, bi uh, biological process as a post treatment some of the groups they used as a pre treatment for altrofendon process that means biological process as a pre or post treatment for altrofendon process dr hugo already covered all these things i think it will it is a nice presentation and already covered the basics and some advancements in the bioaltrofendon thank you hugo for this uh, wonderful lecture it is already uh, is enlightening all the pupils working in this field uh, field because they have a basic they got the basic knowledge of msc yesterday by dr jarazimos libertos thank you for yeah, thank you very much for the invitation thank you thank you then thank you for uh, our uh, experts bubadi dr bubadi dr rajesh and dr suraj join with us for this uh, presentation and making the expert, um, panel discussion as vibrant thank you sir for kind of notice thank you thank so you for, dr rajesh for nice to meeting you okay thank you so uh, for the viewers so our next talk is on monday by professor daniel strong in that monday is july 6 5 pm we will join with uh, join with the professor daniel strong in along with the uh, experts are chaindas from nit War, uh, nagpur k palanivelu from anna university and p dhanajeshagram from uh, chandigarh university so Pro daniel strong in will talk on redox chemistry of arsenite and chromium on iron and manganese oxide till then bye thank you